ask the boater uh, where is their anchor compartment and you can either have them open up these compartments and open them up for you while you're inspecting the boat or if they are comfortable with it you will get, on t get inside their watercraft and then inspect these uh, compartments. I would encourage to stay out of the watercraft if possible if you can view inside of these compartments from standing on uh, the road. It just eliminates a lot of hazards from getting in and out of a boat for safety purposes and liability purposes. So if, you have a, if you're dealing with a smaller watercraft, a lot of times you can look into those from outside the boat and I would encourage that. But some of these larger watercraft sheets inevitably need to get inside of them to inspect it. Talked about this before, here's a storage locker. Look at all that anchor line. This can soak up a lot of water and there can be at times several inches of water sitting inside of these compartments just from using life jackets or dock lines or scuba gear if you're if you run into a scuba diver. These are all uh, compartments that you would want to check over thoroughly. All right, so here's a few photos of ballast tanks. Our newer ballast tanks are going to be in bags. Those older boats might have uh, hard-sided ballast tanks that are plastic. Some of these ballast tanks are removable, which can help remove all the water out of there, but those, those hard-sided ballast tanks are usually going to be fixed into wherever they're at, and it's going to be a lot more difficult to uh, move those at all, so we're going to have to just treat that with hot water. But if we can remove the, the ballast tank and if the owner is comfortable with it, I would encourage that if we are in a high-risk situation where they have been on an infested water body. There also, can be, there also can be multiple ballast tanks. So when you're going through your inspection process, if they have a ballast tank boat, you want to ask them how many ballast tanks they have because that's a drop-down menu that you have to type into on the watercraft inspection app. I mentioned this before, but some people may not realize this, but sailboats a lot of times do have a motor associated with the sailboat. So you want to make sure that you're looking at the hull and trailer, the motors, the centerboard box, all of the fittings associated with that watercraft, and the rudder and keel. All right, so what does a decon consist of? With not ever being familiar with how decontamination is ran, I'm going to break that down for you right now. So the best way to kill any AIS is going to be with hot water, not chemicals. Zebra mussels have the ability to close their shells and prevent any uh, intake of chemicals. So a lot of times people will use bleach or soaps or other chemicals thinking that they're doing their, their best to kill these, but in fact that it's, that's not the best way. You want to use hot water and that ranges anywhere from 120 to 140 degree water that we'll be using. Anything on the interior portion of the watercraft is always going to be low pressure. If you use high pressure in there, you could wreck the paint, you could uh, destroy some uh, hosing associated with some of the compartments uh, or other equipment that's in those compartments. We want to make sure that we're all, always using low pressure and that's going to come out the same pressure of like a garden hose. Your high pressure is going to be what you see on this photo associated with this slide. This is going to be high pressure and this is going to be scraping anything off the exterior hull that we don't want on there. And when we're doing this, we want to make sure that we're 12 inches away from the watercraft uh, at all times. If you get any closer, that uh, amount of force hitting the watercraft could, could actually damage it or, or peel off paint. And when we're working on the exterior portion of the boat, this is going to be 140 degrees for 10 seconds. That same amount of time and temperature is going to be what you're going to be using for your motor flush as well. 95 degree water will kill villagers. But this time frame that we're using just expedites our uh, decontamination process, so we're not sitting there for hours on end. There's been times where they can survive for very short periods of time up to that temperature, and that's why we want to blast them with temperatures far exceeding their threshold to make sure that we are killing anything present. Alright, so when we get to our 
station that we are going to be doing decontaminations at. There's a few things we want to make sure that we're looking over uh, before we open up our inspection station because the last thing you want is to have a non-functional decontamination unit and you have to decontaminate, decontaminate a boat and your decon unit doesn't work. Uh, a lot of times I would suggest you just coming back and working on that decontamination unit versus staying there and not even being able to use it. So you always want to make sure every time you're using it that you're looking at your fluids. There's a gas tank and a diesel tank associated with the decon unit and you want to make sure that uh, your, your motors associated with the decontamination unit have uh, the adequate amount of oil in them. You also want to make sure that the decontamination uh, unit's tank is full of water. The thing that most people want to think about with our decontamination tank, water tanks is that we want to make sure that we are, if we are driving our decontamination unit to a roving station, that you're, when you have that uh, decontamination unit trailered and driving down the roadway, that, tr that tank should either be full or empty. If it's halfway full, there's too much sloshing going around and that can actually pull that trailer off of its hitch. We actually had that happen one time where it became unhitched and went down into the ditch. Luckily it went into the ditch and not across the center median because that could be very dangerous and hazardous on the roadway. So we want to make sure that if we're using our decontamination unit on the road that we're emptying it at the end of our uh, scheduled work day before bringing it back to the shop. If we have a unit that we're using that's not on a reel, if it's just coiled on the unit, we want to make sure that we roll that hose all the way out before using it on a watercraft. And as mentioned before, unless we're using a jet engine, we want to make sure that we have, um, we're have running that water first and that that water supply uh, is connected and we have no leaks in the hose if there are leaks in the hose, I want that addressed immediately so we can get that worked on and fixed before utilizing it the next weekend. And I'll go over a lot of this uh, in the field, uh, but just to start these up, they're, they're relatively easy. There's an on-off switch, so we actually don't even have to use the pull start in most situations. Uh, but you, you turn the unit on, and then you turn the uh, choke over to a full choke, You'll start the engine, and then once it starts up, you'll kill the choke, and the engine should stay running at full bore. And um, the only other thing you have to look at is the heating element. Once you turn it on, you want to make sure that the heating element is on, and then you're going to dial uh, that he heating element to whatever temperature you need it to be, either 120 degrees or 140 degrees. If you're having to use hot water, you want to make sure that when you're done, with a decontamination unit that you're dropping that temperature all the way down on the decon unit and running some cool water through the hosing. Otherwise you can ruin the couplers if you're leaving hot water inside that, uh, inside that hose. So I don't know if everyone has ever used a uh, power washer unit before, but when we are utilizing these, we want to make sure that when we start this up, we're pointing this in a safe direction, towards the ground, away from anyone else, and you're going to pull that trigger to make sure that we have water supply, adequate water supply going to your uh, gun. Um, and as mentioned before, we want to make sure that we're cooling it down after we're using it. Uh, this will be in uh, Fahrenheit, so no one will have to do any calculations on their phones, uh, but the two different temperatures that you're going to be looking at is either 120 degrees or 100, 140 degrees for your decontamination unit. These units can run at a very high pressure, 3000 PSI. Uh, so it is very important that this 12 inch or one foot uh, stipulation is utilized. If you just increase that to six inches, you're quadrupling the amount of force that you're hitting that watercraft with. And you can either dent the boat or pull paint off or ruin uh, hoses or anything like that associated with the exterior of the boat looking at the motor. Uh, also, when you are utilizing these uh, power washing guns, you should only be using the white tip attachment on that uh, power washer. That's going to be a 40 degree tip and when you are decontaminating that watercraft, 
you want to make sure that you're running at a 45 degree angle and you're not doing direct contact on that watercraft. Uh, just like a mower is at a 45 degree angle when you're walking behind it, uh, that's the angle that you should be utilizing when you're spraying off the watercraft. That just helps prevent any damage associated with using uh, the gun. Here's an example of what I'm talking about there. You, only, you don't want that gun straight up and down, you want it at a 45 degree angle, 12 inches away from the watercraft. So how long are we doing a decontamination unit with low pressure? 120? Yes, 120 degrees, or 120 seconds, or two minutes. If we're working on the exterior of the boat, what temperature are we going to be using? 40. Yes. And how long <laughs> are we doing that for? 10 seconds. Exactly. In the rare situation that you are going to have to decontaminate a ballast tank, how long are we doing that for? Is it until full? Jeez. Five minutes is what we generally use for the ballast tanks, just because how long it takes to fill that up. Um, and then we want to make sure that we're using a temperature gun to make sure that we have that adequate temperature inside that ballast tank. It's a red dot on that trigger, on that temperature gun. So I would just constantly be checking that. Um, same thing with our motor flushes. You don't start that time until you have that water coming out the bleeder uh, line on that uh, motor. And I'll show this to you outside, but you want to make sure that you're hitting that temperature gun on that uh, water uh, coming out of the motor. And once you see that 140 degrees, that's when you start your 10 seconds. So sandy water decontaminations are gonna be your most prevalent decontamination that you're doing. There's only a handful of full decontaminations that we do across the entire state um, each year. And hopefully that continues, which means that we don't have a lot of villager fouled or zebra mussel foul boats in the state. Uh, these standing water decons are going to kill all villagers and, other, and all other AIS that is in standing water. It's, it's a targeted procedure, so you're looking at very small areas for the standing water decon. You're never going to just fill up the bottom of the boat with water. Um, and then once we're done with that standing water decon and have that temperature up to what we need it to be, 120 degrees, we're going to remove all that water. It should drain out anyways because all plugs should be removed, but we want to make sure that that water is removed. A few different triggers that would uh, justify a standing water decon. If it's been in a positive water body in the last 30 days and it hasn't been decontaminated de since, or if there's any standing water present. Now you can use your common sense here. If you just went out a day after we had a heavy rain and this person said they haven't been in a water body for uh, an extended period of time and there's a small amount of water in the bottom, just sponge it out and let them go on their way. If we can just sponge these out or towel them out, we won't have to use a standing water decon. But in a lot of situations, you're looking at someone that hasn't pulled a plug and there's a lot of water present, which would signify a standing water decon. And that could also be in your bilge or your ballast tanks. Here's an example of filling up a hard-sided bilge in the far left. Um, if you have a ballast tank that needs to be filled uh, and you can't reach it from any interior compartments, this is called a fake -a lake attachment in that center diagram. It's essentially a plunger that is attached to that through hole fitting on the bottom of the watercraft. And we're gonna push water through that, through our decontamination unit, and we're gonna fill up that ballast tank. A couple things to note about that um, is the amount of uh, force that's pulling up that water into the watercraft. Sometimes these larger boats uh, pull in water at a higher rate than what our decontamination units can put out. So we want to make sure we're talking to them about that, but I'll go over that a little bit further uh, here in a couple slides. And then I mentioned this before, but those earmuffs that you're using to do a, a standing water a decontamination for a motor flush that is displayed in that far right photo. Those muffs are on the bottom side of that lower unit 
and we have a small hosing mechanism that is attached to the handle of your uh, uh, power washing gun. You pull that gun portion off, off that uh, de decontamination unit and you attach this to that and then you'll run water through it. You'll see water coming out of the side of those earmuffs before you start that motor. You'll start the motor and then you'll see water coming out of your bleeder line and that's when you start your time frame on your motor flush. Once it's 140 degrees, it's 10 seconds and then you can kill the motor, turn your temperature down on your decontamination unit. Once you have cold water running through it, then you can kill your decontamination unit. When you're doing your standing water decon on, and doing a motor flush, you want to make sure that that lower unit is lowered uh, as far down as possible. There's a few instances where these motors are so large that if you're on an uneven surface, that lower unit could touch the ground. So this is a team effort here. So one person should be lowering the unit, another person should be looking at the ground to make sure that we're not hitting the ground. Uh, we want to make sure we get it as close to the ground as possible. In most situations, you're not going to have any issues with this, but something to look out for when you when you are lowering a lower unit. And this far right slide, there are different types of muffs you can use for attachments, but you will only be using the one that is displayed here. The other one is actually a hose that you connect in the upper portion of the motor, but there is some higher risk associated with using that and we actually had a situation where we damaged a motor last year that we were liable for fixing, so we're just doing away with that other attachment that is applicable for certain types of motors. When you're placing these muffs on the intake ports, you wanna make sure that those muffs are completely encompassing that intake port. Uh, you wanna make sure that that motor's getting enough water supply when it's started. Uh, once you have the earmuffs on, you're gonna start the decon, decon unit. Should be a lot of water getting flushed out of there. Once you see that that's uh, adequately flushing water, you're gonna start the motor, standing away from the intake port, run that water, and then in most situations, your watercraft owner is gonna be in the boat starting it and stopping it. Um, you'll ask them to kill that motor before you end your decontamination and then lowering that temperature down uh, before shutting off the unit. When you use these fake leg attachments, those poles are extendable. So you can lengthen that pole out. You want to lengthen it out all the way to have that butt end of that uh, wand pressed against the floor or ground that you are doing your decontaminations at. Then you want to step away from that area uh, because that water can spray outside the top of that uh, plunger and it could burn you. So it's a, just a safety factor. You want to make sure that you're staying away from that when utilizing this. There are going to be incidences where this watercraft is trailered and the trailer is blocking that through hull fitting so you're not able to fit that plunger on there adequately. In that situation, you're not going to be able to effectively decontaminate that boat through using the through hull fitting. And if they are coming from a high risk location, there's a chance that we might have to de uh, detain that boat for uh, a decontamination unit back at our office. But you most likely won't run into that situation this summer. So when we're doing a bilge flush, this is technically inside of the boat, so this is going to be a low pressure. Uh, you want to fill that up with four to five gallons at 120 degree temperature, and you're going to want to have the boat owner run that bilge pump and make sure that plug is removed um, from that area. This is a situation where you're getting closer to their more... Uh, precious equipment and the last thing we want to do is ball game uh, their motor or any uh, hoses or lines associated with it. So a lot of times inevitably the boat owner is going to want to do it themselves anyways but ask them to remove that plug uh, once you're done or run that bilge pump once you have that 100, 120 degree water in there. Here's an example of that, that uh, 
bilge uh, that is removable. That's this is a newer technology. These can just get unscrewed. They're fairly easy to remove. Um, once again, I would ask that the owner would do this, not you guys. But if they're not comfortable and they are willing to let you do it, as long as you're comfortable with it, this is the best way to get all that water out of there. And this is the best way to get. Um, if we, if we can flip these upside down and let them drain, this is the first thing I would do when you're starting a decontamination. Uh, is filling these up and then letting them drain out while you're doing the rest of your decontaminations. A lot of people just go about whatever they see first. This is one of the things that you want to let it drain as long as possible. So I would do this first when doing a full decontamination. So as mentioned before, some of these larger boats can pull water in at a higher rate than our decontamination units can put out water. Some of these boats are going from seven to nine gallons per minute where ours can only go up to five gallons per minute. So you should ask the boat owner um, what their intake rate is for water on their ballast tanks. And if they don't know, I would steer away from trying to use the fake light because we don't want to be liable for burning up a, uh, a pump. That's it. Is there any questions before we get out in the field and look at it in person? How, how do you go about finding the, the floods on those ballast tanks? I know when we've been out there, some of the times it's pretty complex. Yeah, so ideally the boat owner will know when you ask them. Uh, otherwise, if they don't know and you can't find it, uh, hopefully there's a boat manual in there that you can look through, which is inevitably going to take more time. Uh, if there's a situation where you have multiple boats lined up, uh, you either have to pull that guy off to the side and, and then run through the other boats, uh, and hopefully most of them are low risk, which you know over 90% of them are, and you can just get those through because uh, you don't want to be backing up your inspection station more than four to five boats at a time. We don't want to be delaying anyone's opportunities uh, more than you know 20 minutes to try to what we. Uh, limit ourselves to when we're doing our inspections because we want to make this as a positive situation as possible. So if you do come into a situation like that, first step, ask the boat owner. Second step, if you can't find it, try to find a boat manual to look at that inside of the glove compartment of the boat or ask them to look for that. Three, call your supervisor that's on call and hopefully they can either find it online for you or they might just know offhand, depending on who you're talking to. I myself is probably, I'm gonna have to look it up for you, but some of our uh, full-time staff on their own boats, they might just know offhand where those might be. But um, this is a very low situation where you're gonna be dealing with this, maybe a handful of times all summer, but as Dave mentioned, it, it can get to be an issue sometimes with some of these more complex ballast tank boats. So um, that's the process that I would go through when looking at that. I mean, just because they have a ballast tank on them, are you going to have? Are you going to be required to, to flush that ballast tank, or is it just in a situation, high risk situation, where they've been on on a zebra mussel infested water? So if they're not on a high risk water body, we're just going to try to uh, ex we're going to try to get rid of as much water as possible, having them just run that bilge pump, and then we'll call that good at that point. But if they are on a high risk um, water body, that's when we're going to be doing our standing water. Uh, the other thing that we want to look at is some people just don't tell the truth. Uh, you know, there's, if you have a, a live well full of water and someone says, oh, it's just rain water or, you know, people don't want to get a ticket either. So you want to take your own assessment of the situation too and uh, make your best judgment call on on whether or not it would need it. If they're going out to the river or if they're, or if they're routinely going out to the river, most likely it's gonna be a higher situation because most of our river system is infested with zebra mussels. But um, yeah, if they're, if they're bringing it out for the first time that year or if they just test ran it at a local lake that's not infested, we just wanna make sure we get as much water out as possible, reducing that risk as much as possible before moving them uh, on their way. What if they tell you they're headed to an infested lake, they just came back from Sharp and say they're, they're going to uh, Lake Mitchell, then does, does the scenario change? Or? No, uh, we would still want to 
decontaminate that or do a standing water decon just because you know plans change. You might be going fishing and saying you're going to dry lake number two and then you get a call from your buddy saying you need to come over to pickerel because they're catching you know limits of perch or bluegill and then you change your your travel corridor up so regardless if you're coming through a hybrid situation um, you're going to want to decontaminate that uh, if at all possible. And if you guys ever have any questions in the field there should always be someone on call that should be able to answer your question and if they don't know the answer they'll call me and I'll get the answer for you so don't ever feel like your upper creek without a pow because someone will be there to help you guys if you come into a sticky situation. Last year, our very first week out in the field, some of our interns had a deal with two infested water or two infested watercrafts uh, out at our Mitchell station, and those were one of three or four that we dealt with all summer through all of our inspection stations. So uh, you never know when you're going to be dealing with it, but uh, that's how we try to keep you guys as as high prepared for the situation as possible before you guys get out there in the field. And we'll always have a binder with my presentation in it in our toolkit. So if you guys forget exactly what needs to be done in a certain situation, you should be able to reference that presentation manual for that information. Especially out in the hills, as you see, the reception might not be the greatest, so you need something like that just in case. So. Any other questions? All right. Next in the field, out of the office. 